This PowerPoint presentation features the Euthyphro, which is a dialogue written by Plato, who was a student of Socrates, who we will be studying in detail down the road. The Euthyphro is a typical place to begin to introduce students to Socrates and the Socratic method. This dialogue is often taken as a paradigmatic or model example of the Socratic method in action. This doesn't mean that it's an easy dialogue, and hopefully you've read the piece, The Euthyphro, already, so you have a little bit of background. And if you've read it, you probably have quite a few questions. Um, it's not initially very obvious what's going on in this dialogue, and that can be a source of some frustration for students. But the basic idea to keep in mind is what we're focusing on is the Socratic method and the interaction of Socrates and Euthyphro. The specific subject matter of the dialogue is holiness or piety. And this is of less concern to us, not not that we're not going to be interested in these kinds of questions. These will come up again, especially when we look at uh, arguments for God's existence, the problem of evil, and, and the divine command theory of ethics. But at this point, for our purposes, the main thing to focus on is the interaction between Socrates and Euthyphro, how Socrates proceeds in his manner of investigation, and exactly what it is he's up to as he interacts with Euthyphro on the question of holiness. Hopefully, as we go through each of the steps of the dialogue and I step you through them and talk about each move, the, the general outline of what's going on here will perhaps become clearer as we proceed. Um, if you've read this dialogue already, I recommend going through this PowerPoint lecture uh, and, and looking at the details uh, that as I discuss them, and then go back to read it again, and I think you'll see that the second time through, the dialogue will hopefully make a lot more sense. The Euthyphro is a dialogue between Socrates and a character named Euthyphro, who was a real person, in which they try to investigate the meaning of the concept of holiness or piety. What Socrates is looking for, apparently, is some description of the essential features of holiness or piety that can be used to understand all of the ways in which this term appears. For example, we talk about many things being holy or pious. We can talk about holy people, holy places, holy books, holy practices or rituals. And Socrates assumes, therefore, since we use this term in so many different contexts, there must be one common central meaning that all of these ideas share. In other words, if a book and a place are both referred to as being holy, then they must share some common feature that is intrinsic to or essential to this idea of holiness or piety. We saw in our last discussion of Socrates and the general features of Socratic philosophy that Socrates claims not to have any knowledge. And so, therefore, since he himself doesn't know, or at least he claims not to know, the source of information for Socrates will always have to be someone else. In this case, the someone else is Euthyphro, who we'll talk about in just a little bit. Euthyphro claims to know about holiness and what the holy or the pious means, and it is in interaction with Euthyphro that we can see a nice illustration of how the Socratic method of questioning other people's beliefs is illustrated. We also see an illustration of Socratic irony uh, in Socrates' claim that he himself knows nothing about holiness or piety and therefore uh, is asking for this information from Euthyphro, who claims to be an expert on these matters. This is a very interesting technique that Socrates employs and what it does is it puts the entire burden 
on the person with whom he is speaking. It's a way of flipping roles, if you will. Socrates places himself in the role of the student and puts the burden of being the teacher on the person who claims to have knowledge. Of course, in conversation with Socrates, it will turn out that this person who is supposed to have knowledge, in this case Euthyphro, in fact does not. Because for Socrates, having knowledge means being able to define that thing about which you're supposed to know. If you cannot define it, then you do not know it. And as it will turn out, as Euthyphro tries to define what it means to be holy or pious, he will fail. And therefore, since he cannot successfully do it, he doesn't actually know it, and therefore he's not suitable as a teacher of this concept. Um, Socrates in this dialogue appears to be very critical of traditional religious beliefs of Athenian society as represented by Euthyphro. What he's most critical of is the kind of simplistic, conventional, simply uh, repeating or parroting of these ideas without actually investigating them to see if they make any sense. According to Socrates, it's not sufficient merely to learn something, but rather you have to think about it for yourself to see if it makes any sense, and apparently Euthyphro has never done this. In the course of the conversation early on in the dialogue, one interesting fact that we learn is we learn a little bit about the trial that Socrates will soon be going to, his own trial, and we learn about the charges that are going to be uh, defended, that Socrates is going to have to defend himself against in this trial, and they include impiety and corrupting the youth. What this does is provide a handy way for Plato, who wrote this dialogue, to, to turn the, the conversation to the topic of piety. Socrates can claim that it's urgent for him to learn about piety since he's going to be going on trial for being impious, that is for not being pious, and since Euthyphro has claimed to be an expert about piety, this is a wonderful opportunity for Socrates to learn about this subject so that he could perhaps defend himself more vigorously at his trial. In order to have a better understanding of this dialogue and what's going on in the conversation with Socrates and Euthyphro, it would be useful to have a little bit of background knowledge. Um, it would be useful to know a little bit about Euthyphro and his family, the case that Euthyphro is bringing against his father, and the case against Socrates, because all of these are, are functioning in the background of this dialogue. So let's talk a little bit first about Euthyphro. Um, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot of knowledge that we have about Euthyphro. He's really only mentioned in Plato's writings in the Euthyphro itself and in another dialogue, though we know that he was an actual person. Euthyphro is presented as an eccentric religious fanatic. As he tells Socrates early on in the dialogue, he thinks of himself as a religious expert who can tell the future. He functions kind of as a fortune teller or a soothsayer. He also tells us that he's not respected. That is, he's not respected by his fellow citizens who often make fun of him when he tries to speak in the assembly. Uh, and uh, what Plato appears to be doing here is foreshadowing or anticipating um, what's going to be the result of this conversation with Socrates in which Euthyphro claims to have this religious knowledge, but under uh, closer scrutiny, turns out that maybe perhaps he doesn't know as much as he claims to know. Euthyphro, because of his initial confidence and lack of guile and self-consciousness, is the perfect foil for Socrates, because he is a person who thinks he knows something, but who is in fact ignorant about what he claims to know. Euthyphro's family was a typical ancient Greek household, or oikos, as it was called in ancient Greek, which is incidentally the origin of the English word economy. Oikonomia is the running of the household, keeping the books, paying the bills, things that have to do with the financial running of the household. 
In a typical ancient Greek household, the father is considered the supreme authority of the family. It's a hierarchical structure. The father is the head of the household. The wife and the children have an obligation of reverence towards the father. The children have an obligation of reverence towards their parents and also towards their ancestors. So it's a hierarchical structure where the father is the supreme authority, which is what initially gives this dialogue its dramatic uh, impetus because Socrates is shocked to hear that Euthyphro is actually bringing a lawsuit against his father. This would be practically unheard of in ancient Greek society. It's shocking to the average Greek. Another element of the typical uh, uh, Greek family at this time that you need to know about is that slavery in ancient Athenian society was quite commonplace. Unlike slavery in the United States prior to the Civil War, ancient Greek slavery was not based on matters of race, but rather uh, most slaves were either conquered in, in military uh, victories and or people who were very poor who had sold themselves into service. Uh, slavery was very common and it was typical of almost every ancient Greek household to have at least one slave. Even the poorest person had at least one slave. So the fact that Euthyphro's family is a slave-owning family should not be considered something unusual or something that, that, um, that uh, causes us to be opposed to them initially, although we would be if they were, of course, contemporary Americans. They're not contemporary Americans, and so this is a typically normal situation. Uh, in their cultural context. This brings us to the case against Euthyphro's father. Euthyphro is prosecuting his father for the murder by negligence of a slave. He tells Socrates a very odd story about how his father owned a slave. This slave got drunk, got in a fight, and killed another slave. At this point, Euthyphro's father, unsure how to proceed, takes his slave, who had killed the other slave, ties up his slave, and throws him in a ditch, all tied up, and goes off to seek advice from the local legal authorities. And it takes so long to get any information that the slave that has been tied up dies of neglect. Now, this is a really strange situation, and to our ears, it seems obvious that Euthyphro's father has committed a horrible act of aggression and has actually murdered this slave. This sounds normal to us, but to the ancient Greeks, this would have been um, a very unusual situation. Uh, first of all, the prosecution of a parent would have been considered shocking and irreverent behavior to the ancient Greeks as I have already indicated. They would have considered that Euthyphro father, Euthyphro's father was responsible for the slave's death, perhaps deserves to pay a fine and maybe uh, pay restitution um, to the slave that his slave actually killed. But within the context of their beliefs, uh, this would not have been considered the murder of someone with uh, the same social standing as, say, a, an Athenian citizen. The factor that, that causes this to become an issue in which piety and holiness is relevant has to do with the fact that homicide in ancient Greek society is considered a religious crime. The person who commits such a crime um, is tainted with what the Greeks called miasma or pollution. That is, the, the, uh, that they are in some way uh, contaminated by the action, that there's blood on their hands, which is a symbolic representation of the hostility of the gods towards this act and the likelihood of retribution by the murdered person from the afterlife. There was some belief that, that uh, the murdered person would seek out revenge, and this revenge would uh, affect not only the person who committed the murder, but uh, their household, and by extension, even their their polis, their city state. So it was a, it was a kind of a contagious religious pollution that is the subject uh, of or the uh, the the quality that a murderer acquires.
So for, for Euthyphro, this is a very serious issue because he doesn't want his father to be tainted with this pollution, which could affect the entire family. And so therefore, he seems to believe not only that his father did something wrong, but that by bringing his father to trial, he can in some way clear the pollution and therefore restore the family to its previous state of wholeness, if you will. On the other hand, Socrates faces two charges. He is being charged by the Athenians with impiety and with corrupting the youth. We'll learn something more of these charges when we look at the defense speech of Socrates at his trial. But basically, Socrates is accused of not worshipping the official gods of the city, with making up his own divinities, and with corrupting the youth by getting them to question their traditional beliefs. The charge of impiety is what links the case of Socrates to the case of Euthyphro and allows an opening for Socratic irony. Socrates can claim to be ignorant about holiness and unholiness, and he can legitimately ask Euthyphro, who claims to know about such things, for clarification. Euthyphro plays right into the hands of Socrates. He's more than happy to offer Socrates uh, his wisdom, and he's more than happy to answer Socrates' question, which involves defining the essential nature of holiness. Because Euthyphro believes that his father has done something unholy, that Euthyphro himself is doing something holy. If Euthyphro is correct, he must therefore know something about the nature of this matter. And if he knows, he can say what he knows. So when Socrates hears what Euthyphro is up to, he's shocked. He's shocked by Euthyphro's attempt to prosecute his father for murder. Well, at least he, he pretends to be shocked. Um, he asks Euthyphro if he could be certain that he's doing the right thing in prosecuting his father. How can he know for sure? He must really be very confident that his knowledge of holiness is correct. And Euthyphro responds that he's certain that he's doing the right thing. He knows what is holy and what is unholy, and he's absolutely convinced that he is correct in proceeding against his father. So now Socrates, uh, perhaps ironically, asks Euthyphro for an explanation. Socrates says, well, you claim to know all about these matters. I don't know anything about them but it would certainly benefit me to know about them since I'm about to go on trial for issues relating to holiness and unholiness and my supposed impiety. So it would really help me out if the, if the acclaimed religious expert Euthyphro can give me his advice, can tell me what holiness is, and therefore I could use this information during my trial to help defend myself. And Euthyphro, brimming with confidence, is more than happy to help Socrates out and proceeds to offer Socrates what he believes to be the definition of holiness, which we will explore here in just a second. Without hesitation, Euthyphro says, I know exactly what holiness is. Holiness is what I am doing now, prosecuting a criminal. And he proceeds to support this definition of holiness by making appeals to uh, conventional ancient Greek wisdom and the story of the of how the Olympians uh, prosecuted the older gods, the Titans. Um, and he uses this story to support his action against his father. Now, at this point, the Socratic method begins to kick in. Socrates is never going to be content with simply accepting what people say as being true without first exploring it and seeing whether or not it makes sense. And so every time that Euthyphro offers a definition for holiness, Socrates is going to say, okay, now let's think it through. Let's see if what you're saying, Euthyphro, makes any sense. Is it contradictory? Does it fit together with other things you already accept as true? In other words, does this definition form part of a coherent belief system or does it is it out of sync with other things you accept as true which you are not willing to give up? 
And so he looks at what Euthyphro has said, that holiness is prosecuting a criminal like I'm doing, and he says, the problem with this definition is that it fails to answer the question. What Socrates is looking for is not an example of a holy or a pious act, which prosecuting a criminal may very well be. Rather, what Socrates is looking for is a general description of the essential features of anything that may be called pious or holy. So he's looking for a common central feature that pertains to all things that are pious or holy, not merely an example. Let me give you a parallel case, and I think you'll see why the criticism of Socrates makes sense. Let's say, for example, that I asked you to give me a definition of what an automobile is. And you say, sure, I know all about automobiles. I've been driving most of my life. An automobile. Well, here's what it is. A Ford Mustang is an automobile. Well, that's correct. You would be correct. Your claim that a Ford Mustang is an automobile is absolutely true. The problem is it hasn't answered the question. It's an example of an automobile, but it doesn't tell me anything about what an automobile is. In fact, it begs the question, why is a Ford Mustang an automobile? What are the features of an automobile so that I can know that your claim is correct? So it's an evasion of an answer instead of an actual answer. So Socrates doesn't have to know the answer to the question, what is holiness, in order to know that Euthyphro's answer is mistaken. He's approaching it on purely formal or logical grounds and showing Euthyphro that it doesn't answer the question that was posed. It doesn't capture the essence of holiness. It's merely an example. It's clear from his initial response that Euthyphro wasn't actually certain what Socrates was after when he asked him for a definition of holiness. But after the first failed attempt at defining holiness and the criticism that Socrates offered, Euthyphro seems ready to try again. Now he understands what Socrates is trying to get at, and so Euthyphro offers a second definition of holiness, one that attempts to meet the criterion of being universal and applicable to more than just the one example that he had given in his first definition. And so he says that holiness, wherever we find it, has the essential feature of being what is agreeable to or dear to the gods. And conversely, the unholy would therefore be what is not agreeable or not dear to the gods. This is a step in the right direction. It is certainly an improvement over the first definition because it is not an example. It's a general characterization, which tries to capture the essential property of holiness. Now the question is, is it not merely uh, a, a general definition, but is it an, is it an acceptable definition? Uh, can it withstand critical scrutiny? And so Socrates says, let's investigate what you've said and let's see if it makes sense. Now here, the Socratic method, Socrates' questioning of Euthyphro, takes a slightly different turn than it did in the criticism of the first definition. What Socrates does is appeal to other things that he and Euthyphro accept as being true. In this case, what Socrates appeals to is Euthyphro's belief about the gods and about the, the ancient Greek pantheon. The ancient Greeks believed that there were many gods, that they were not all equal, that there was one main god, which was Zeus, and many lesser gods that each had a domain over various aspects of the natural world and the human world. Um, and these gods frequently quarreled with each other. Anyone who's read uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey of Homer understands how the uh, ancient Greeks were constantly, the ancient Greek gods, that is, were constantly quarreling with each other and causing problems for each other. And they frequently had disagreements. They would pick their favorites and 
uh, some peop- some of the gods would like a certain person and some of the gods would not like another person. They would frequently disagree about these things. For example, in the Odyssey, Odyssey uh, Odysseus is seen to be dear to or uh, agreeable to many of the gods, but not dear to many of the other gods. So some gods love him and some gods don't. And this is, is something that Euthyphro accepts as absolutely true. The problem is, when we take this background knowledge and then we try to apply Euthyphro's second definition, we see that one or the other has to go. Either the definition has to go or the background beliefs have to go. If we accept that the gods disagree about what they find dear, then it turns out that Euthyphro's definition can't make any sense because if we look at, at Odysseus, for example, since Odysseus is dear to some of the gods, Odysseus would have to be holy. But since Odysseus is not dear to other gods, Odysseus would at the same time have to be unholy. So Euthyphro's definition implies that something can be holy and unholy at the same time, which is clearly contradictory. It's clearly contradictory if we accept what Euthyphro accepts about the ancient Greek uh, religious order. Since he's not willing to give up his beliefs about the ancient Greek religious order, it turns out that his definition must therefore fail on logical grounds because it's not compatible with his, his previous belief system and it leads to contradiction, so therefore it's flawed and must be abandoned. One of the things that makes reading the Euthyphro so enjoyable is that there's a kind of a underlying comic element to it. As Euthyphro slowly begins to lose confidence in his interactions with Socrates, he starts off bold and furious, right? Certain of himself and very, very confident. And as he continuously, sequentially fails to answer these questions that Socrates is posing, you can detect that Euthyphro's confidence is beginning to crumble. Um, and he starts to get a little bit more petulant as the conversation proceeds. After his second definition has failed, he regroups and he tries to offer a, a kind of an improvement. He fixes it up to try to, to avoid some of the implications of what Socrates has raised. And he offers as his third definition the idea that what all the gods approve of is holy and what they all disapprove of is unholy. Now this is clearly an improvement. It's clearly a step in the right direction because it does not lead to the contradictory implications we saw in the second definition. It rules out divine disagreement. So therefore, they, the gods have to be unanimous, and therefore you're not going to have a situation where some gods approve and some gods disapprove as being characteristic of holiness. They all have to agree. If they all agree, if they all approve of it, it's holy. If they all agree and they all disapprove of it, it's unholy, whatever it may be. At this point, the dialogue gets very, very abstract. And if you got frustrated in reading this dialogue, it's probably right around here as Socrates offers his criticism of Euthyphro's third definition. There's a very long logical analysis that, that may well have uh, left you scratching your head. And I'm not going to go into all of the details. The analysis is quite interesting. We'll talk about some important elements of it next week when we look at the divine command theory because one of the issues that Socrates raises uh, is still a, a significant problem in philosophy um, that is called the Euthyphro Dilemma for divine command theory, which we'll explore next time. But I will focus on one aspect of Socrates' critique, which I think uh, is, is quite easy to understand. And it allows us to see that Euthyphro's definition, although an improvement, nevertheless fails to answer the question that Socrates is after. Remember, Socrates is looking at the, uh, he's looking for the essential features of anything that is holy. Euthyphro has said that 
what is essential to holiness is that it is approved by the gods. The problem with this answer is that it doesn't actually tell us anything about the essential properties of, of what is holy. It only offers us what philosophers call an accidental or secondary, an incidental property of holiness, but not one that is essential to holiness. I think a parallel example will help to make clear exactly what the flaw is with this definition. Let's say we're talking about chocolate cake, and, and you mentioned chocolate cake, but I'm not familiar with what that actually is. Let's say I'm, I'm new to your planet, and I've never eaten this chocolate cake that, of which you speak. And so I say, well, what is this chocolate cake that you're talking about? And you tell me, oh, chocolate cake, that's what all children love. Well, that might be true. It might be, in fact, a property of chocolate cake that all children love it, but notice that tells us something merely secondary about chocolate cake. It still doesn't tell me anything at all about what chocolate cake actually is. So the claim is actually true. I think it's true that all children love chocolate cake. Uh, the problem is, is that doesn't tell us anything about chocolate cake. In fact, it tells us more about children than chocolate cake, and so therefore it doesn't answer the question. At this point, Euthyphro is beginning to get quite agitated and irritated with Socrates, and he launches into a, uh, a bit of a, a critical diatribe against Socrates, and he says, see, Socrates, this is why you're in so much trouble, because you get people all confused, and people are, they think they know what they're talking about, and they get in a conversation with you, and the next thing you know, they're all confused about what they thought they knew, um, and he's, he's getting less willing to participate in this conversation, this, this dialectical exercise with Socrates. He's no longer willing even to offer uh, a definition. He probably has nothing left to say. Um, and so Socrates has to kind of step in and make a suggestion, which then Euthyphro accepts, because clearly he's out of ideas. And Socrates then says, well, maybe... Euthyphro, maybe what you're trying to say is that, uh, as he puts it, maybe holiness is a species of justice. This sounds kind of cryptic, but it's actually a very straightforward claim. Uh, justice uh, in, in the ancient Greek world is, is the idea of, in general, doing the right thing. Uh, there's justice in the family, acting in the right way towards your family. There's legal justice, and there can be justice with respect to, to acting towards the gods in the proper way, doing the right thing with respect to the gods. And so what, what Socrates is saying to Euthyphro is, maybe what you believe is that holiness is part of doing the right thing with respect to the gods. And Euthyphro says, exactly, that's exactly what I've been trying to say all along. So now, uh, Euthyphro has accepted this suggestion made by Socrates. Socrates then says, well, okay, now let's see whether or not this suggestion makes any sense. Um, so now we're saying that holiness is part of, or it's a species of justice uh, that has to do with looking after the gods. And Socrates points out that looking after implies improvement. Um but this doesn't seem to make any sense. When we, when we look after horses, for example, our goal is not to make them worse, but to make them better. So looking after means taking care of and improving. But it doesn't seem possible for mere humans to improve the gods. So uh, if holiness is that part of justice that has to do with looking after the gods, in this sense, uh, this definition doesn't seem to make any sense either. And so it would seem to, to fall in with the others and fail on, on purely logical grounds. It doesn't make any sense for us to look after the gods in the sense of improving them in any way. So the claim that holiness is the part of justice that involves looking after the gods has to be abandoned, and Euthyphro does abandon it in favor of the claim that 
Holiness is instead knowing how to pray and sacrifice in a way that will please the gods. Now at this point, Socrates takes a very active role in the dialogue and is intentionally leading Euthyphro in a certain direction because he has a certain goal he wants Euthyphro to reach. Socrates says, okay, what do the gods receive from these prayers and sacrifices? And Euthyphro replies that they are gratified by them. They, they are pleased when we human beings worship them in the proper way. And Socrates points out that uh, it is true that the gods approve of what gratifies them, do they not? And Euthyphro willingly accepts this uh, assertion by Socrates. So Socrates says, what you're, what you're actually saying, Euthyphro, if I understand you correctly, is that the holy or holiness turns out to be what the gods approve of. And Euthyphro says, that's exactly right, Socrates. That's what I've been trying to get at all along. The problem with this, of course, is that this is almost exactly the same as the second definition that Euthyphro offered earlier on, which he himself has seen previously to make no sense at all. So therefore, Socrates has perhaps intentionally led Euthyphro in a circle back to an already rejected definition. His reason for doing this perhaps is to bring home to Euthyphro as vigorously as he can the idea that Euthyphro has no idea what he's talking about, which appears to be the case. Euthyphro's prosecution of his father hinged completely on his claim to expertise in religious matters. He can righteously prosecute his father for doing an unholy or impious action because Euthyphro knows what holiness or piety are, and therefore he can know that he's doing the right thing. Um, unfortunately, uh, as the encounter with Socrates brings, uh, brings out, he, he can't actually know what is holy or pious because he can't say what holiness is. He has no idea what holiness or piety mean. And therefore, uh, it might be the case that his prosecution is therefore unjustified. It's not something he should be so utterly confident about. Uh, after we reach the end of, of the several criticisms of the several definitions offered by Euthyphro, uh, Socrates suggests suggests that both he and Euthyphro have no idea what they're talking about. As he says, I, Socrates says, I have no idea what I'm talking about. You claim to know what you're talking about, but I think we both realize that neither one of us knows anything. And so Socrates proposes that they begin again, that they uh, begin a thorough investigation of their beliefs, that they try to get down to the bottom of this idea and truly understand the nature of holiness, which might be a very, uh, in-depth exercise. It might take quite a bit of effort to do this. Euthyphro makes a hasty excuse and, and, and begs off. He says, I've, I'm sorry, Socrates, I'd love to do that, but I've got to go. And, and he takes off. And the dialogue ends without any resolution. Uh, the term for this is aporia, which we've mentioned in the previous discussion of Socrates and his method. This is an aporetic dialogue. There's no ultimately satisfying definition of holiness that is offered. That's kind of the point here. Of course, it, it would be very unphilosophical for Socrates to be presented as criticizing someone else's knowledge and then at the very end to offer the correct definition um, without any effort whatsoever. His, his task is a, a little bit different than that. He's trying to show in his interaction with Euthyphro that Euthyphro doesn't actually know what he thinks he knows, but this is not a purely negative enterprise that Socrates is carrying out. It may seem that way at first. It may seem like Socrates is kind of a jerk in the sense that he just undermines everything that Euthyphro believes, but that's not the ultimate goal. The, the basic presupposition that, that Socrates is operating with is that the, the, the kind of knowledge that Euthyphro claims to have is of crucial importance. 
what could be more important for us to know than the right way to live and the right way to act? This is crucial uh, for our personal happiness and, broadly speaking, for, for our society as well, for living in a better society. So this is really important information. If we think we have this information, but we are mistaken, then in fact we are likely to act in a way that is harmful to ourselves. When we become aware that we don't actually know what we think we know, we lose a little bit. But what we lose is worth losing. We lose false beliefs that can be misleading. More importantly, what this encounter with Socrates does is it makes us aware of our own ignorance. And for Socrates, that is the key. It's only when we become aware that we lack the knowledge we thought we had, that we lack enlightenment, that this becomes a problem for us. And that therefore the search for enlightenment, the active critical evaluation of our beliefs and other people's beliefs becomes something of central importance. Um, which we would never have undertaken unless we realized that we didn't have what we thought we had, that we don't know what we think we know. So the goal of this encounter with Socrates may initially appear kind of negative, but in fact, uh, that negativity is only temporary. It's designed to be part of a larger step in reorienting ourselves towards investigation of our beliefs towards knowing ourselves uh, and towards focusing on uh, our beliefs in order to see whether or not they make sense and whether or not they're true. And so the Socratic project, which we see illustrated here in the Euthyphro, uh, it doesn't actually lead initially to any answers, but rather by, by opening up uncertainty, it makes us, first of all, aware that such answers are difficult to achieve. Also, it makes us aware that we don't have such answers. But finally, it makes us aware of the absolute importance of the pursuit of such answers in order to achieve happiness and to live a well-lived life. So the Socratic project is ultimately part of a kind of an existential project. Uh, it's, it, as Socrates sees it, it's part of his religious mission to get people to be concerned with their own well-being, with the care of their soul, as he puts it, by examining their beliefs and by striving to attain true knowledge and true insight into the right way to live and into virtue. Now, when we when we interpret it that way, what we're doing is we're putting the Socratic project in the best light possible. But this isn't how most people took an encounter with Socrates. A lot of people, when subject to the kind of cross-examination that Socrates subjected people to, uh, came to resent this criticism. Um, and they came to see Socrates as a kind of an uh, a kind of a negative element, a corrosive element within society because Socrates undermines confidence in traditional values. For Socrates, it's not merely enough to believe something because you were raised to believe it. You have to understand it and explore whether or not it makes any sense. And in doing that, you might be confused. You might be led to reject what you previously thought was absolutely clear. And so, therefore, Socrates, uh, over the course of time, irritated a lot of people. And a lot of people in Athenian society saw him as socially and morally dangerous, uh, especially conservative elements within Athenian society saw him as undermining traditional values. That's what leads to the charge of corrupting the youth, because Socrates acquired a lot of youthful followers who would imitate him and begin to question the beliefs of their parents and the house and the household, which, as we saw, is uh, something that was unheard of in ancient Athenian society. So Socrates eventually became viewed, in some respects, as a as a threat to Athenian values. Now, 
Of course, he's going to reject this interpretation of his project, and he's going to offer a defense of his philosophical activity. And we're going to read about this defense in our next uh, lesson, where we look at the apology of Socrates, the defense speech that he gives at his trial, which is, in a way, a defense of living the philosophical life. And he's going to try to make a case that what he is doing is not only important, it's absolutely necessary and beneficial to anyone who wants to live a well-lived life. So at this point, we'll turn to the apology and after reading it, I also have another PowerPoint that will try to guide you through the main uh, aspects of it, and we'll see whether or not Socrates' defense of his philosophical activity is plausible and makes any sense to us.